it was Saturday night and dark. A bunch of us were at my cousin's house. He lived across the street from the Episcopal Church with plenty of nooks, crannies, bushes, and little exterior lighting. It was the perfect place to play hide and seek. When the night is dark, the clouds low, the moon a sliver, the shadows deep, hide and seek is even better. It's a kid's game, but anybody can play it. It's a fun game when you play it with your friends. It is a dangerous game to play with God. Seems foolish on the surface, doesn't it? Does anybody think that we can run and hide from God? I bet you've tried it. I know I have. The Bible poster boy for this behavior is a prophet named Jonah. We're gonna spend the next four Sundays tracking his story. I invite you to open your Bible today to Jonah chapter one, verses one through 17, first chapter. Frank Sinatra sings a song that has this line, nice work if you can get it, and you can get it if you try. Well, being a prophet of the living God is nice work, but there is no line at the prophet booth at the job fair. Prophet work is gritty, it's tough. More critics than fans have to go eyeball with kings, false prophets, idolaters. Sometimes God would tell prophets to do weird things. Ezekiel, don't cry when I take your wife in death. Isaiah, walk around stripped and naked for three years. Jeremiah, make chains and a yoke bars for yourself and put them on your neck. Hosea, go marry a temple prostitute. And the prophets did them. They did, they did them to draw pictures bolder than their words. Weird stuff sometimes, but the prophets obeyed. Jonah had at least one act of obedience in a story told in 2 Kings chapter 14. He prophesied that King Jeroboam II would extend Israel's boundaries and God made it happen. Good for Jonah, right? But that's a slow pitch right down the middle. No prophet risks trouble predicting good news. But in this story, God calls Jonah to one tough assignment and instead of saluting and saying, sir, yes, sir, Jonah tries to run and hide from God. And though this book bears Jonah's name, this is God's story. This is a God story. Words that can be translated God are used 39 times in 44 verses. That's a lot of God. A persistent, seeking, missionary God who is committed to seeking and saving the lost. Whether it's a straying prophet or a pagan city. In the first chapter, we meet a running, hiding prophet and a chasing, seeking, hounding God. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. Captain approached him and said, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Come on, the sailors said to each other, let's cast lots, then we'll know who's to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lot and the lot singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us, who's to blame for this trouble we're in? What's your business? Where are you from? What's your country? What people are you from? He answered them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were seized by a great fear and said to him, what is this you've done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you so that the sea will calm down for us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. He answered them, pick me up and throw me into the sea so that it will calm down for you for I know that I'm to blame for this great storm that is against you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. So they called out to the Lord, please, Lord, Don't let us perish because of this man's life and don't charge us with innocent blood for you, Lord, have done just as you pleased. Then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its raging. The men were seized by a great fear of the Lord. 
and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah is a prophet on the run. God says go, Jonah says no. No wonder the narrator of our story doesn't dignify Jonah with the title of prophet. Jonah's called a prophet in 2 Kings, but not here. The narrator just names Jonah's dad and moves on. When God calls, it's the prophet's task to go. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Just ask Isaiah, ask Jeremiah, ask Elijah, ask Micah, just ask Amos. Amos was a farmer, not a professional prophet uh, like Jonah, and yet God called Amos to leave his farm and his sheep, go preach against Israel, and Amos obeyed. But not Jonah. His duty was clear enough, go and preach against Nineveh. No way to misunderstand that assignment. Uh, No need to ask for time to pray and discern God's direction. God is as clear as HDTV, and Jonah makes a run for it, not because he didn't understand God's call, but because he did. As one commentator put it, voting with his feet, Jonah hotfoots it to Joppa to catch a ship to the ends of the earth. The narrator doesn't hint at Jonah's motives until chapter four. But I suspect nationalism played a role. Nineveh was the growing bully on the block. What if they come for Israel? Fear likely played a role. The Ninevites were vicious, known for being vicious with their enemies. Should the Ninevites not take kindly? To his announcement of their impending destruction, Jonah doesn't want to be impaled on a pole or skinned like a catfish. Maybe Jonah also remembered God telling Abraham that he had Sodom and Gomorrah in his crosshairs, and yet when Abraham started praying for the city's God with this pounding missionary heartbeat showed a willingness to relent and spare those evil cities if he could find even 10 righteous people inside the walls. Maybe Jonah didn't want to risk any chance for Nineveh to turn and be spared. But regardless of his motives, God gave Jonah a job to do and Jonah hightailed it in the opposite direction. Jonah ran to escape his duty. But before we scold Jonah, let's look in the mirror. You're not a prophet. Any prophets in the house? You're not a prophet. But I'm guessing you've heard God tell you to do some act of service for him. And you've said, no, no. It's not my gift. I don't have time. I need more training. I'm overqualified. Someone else should have that blessing. I'm holding out for a management position. And God calls us to our duty and we say, don't, don't call me God, I'll, I'll call you. Sometimes we go Jonah on God. And not just in our obedience, but even in our relationship with God. In verse three, the word flee that's used to describe Jonah's attempt to escape from God is often used in the scripture to describe a running away from relationships. Hagar fled from Sarah, Jacob fled from Laban, Moses fled from Pharaoh. The idea is to make a break from those relationships and start a new life outside of those relationships. And it's possible to flee from a people or even a community. I'm shaking the dust of this lousy town off my feet and I'm never coming back again. Or you you call yourselves family? Well, if I ever see any of you again, it'll be too soon. People do that all the time, some, some for good reason. But Jonah tried to run away from the presence of God. He knew it would take drastic action. That's why he caught a ship for Tarshish, a city located maybe in Spain, clean on the other side of the Mediterranean from Israel. So Tarshish seemed like the perfect hiding place from God. It was far away. Jonah might be the only Jew in the city, so there would be no community of faith to remind him of his duty or his call or his God, Jonah tried to escape his relationship with God. You, you ever tried that? Sometimes God disappoints people. He didn't answer my prayer. He didn't get me the promotion. He didn't save my marriage. I didn't make the team. I didn't get the job. Sometimes God doesn't meet our expectations and we feel hurt and angry and maybe bitter. And we run from him. Or we run because we know what he wants for us and we're not interested in that. So we give him the cold shoulder, the silent treatment. We pretend he doesn't exist. Are you running today from your relationship with God? There are warning signs. You drift, you drop out, you step away from God and his church. 
you major on minors. And even if you hide from him in church, there's no heart in your worship, no passion in your faith, no joy in your soul. And if these warning signs are ringing true for you, then you may be going Jonah on God and catching your own boat to your own Tarshish. And to which Tarshish will you flee? Will you run into unhealthy relationships? Will you bury yourself in alcohol or work or family? Will you push God to the margins of your life instead of keeping him at the center, treating him as Lord? Isn't that what Jonah did? I'll, I'll preach to my own people, God. I'll even give Jeroboam an earful, but I draw the line at Nineveh. By pushing God out to the margins, by determining to be your own God, you are going Jonah on God and you are racing off to your own Tarshish. And God won't rob you of your choice. He'll let you go. But when you and I choose to run and hide from God, we'd best understand something else. Running from God creates some real problems. If you ignore God, if you, if you say, God, just talk to my hand, if you say no to his yes for your life, you will likely experience some distress. In the midst of the storm at sea, we find Jonah in verses five and six, in a deep sleep, sound asleep. Could that sleep be his way of trying to forget his distress? You've tried that, right? Maybe if I can just go to sleep, things will be better when I wake up. Jonah's in distress. He claims as much when he prays in chapter two. I called to the Lord out of my distress. And the distress didn't begin in the fish. It began when he ran from God. And such distress sends life into a downward spiral. Notice, did you notice? Did you listen, hear the, the way the narrator describes Jonah's descent? He went down to Joppa. Once on the ship, Jonah went down below deck and eventually Jonah went down into the sea. Do you hear the rhythm of the text? Down, down, down. And that's the inevitable spiral of life for the person who tries to run from God. When you run from God, you run from the truth about yourself and about your life. Witness the addict who says, I don't have a problem, yet loses a family, a job, a life. Down, down, down. Witness a believer who persists in rejecting the known will of God for her life, and you watch her faith, her joy, often the circumstances of her life will go down, down, down. Witness the life of an unbeliever who God convicts of sin to bring him to forgiveness and to life, and when he ignores God's voice and runs away from him so many times, and you can just about mark it down, the circumstances of his life will go down, down, down. I mean, make no mistake about it, running, hiding from the Lord creates real distress. D.H. Lawrence says it this way in his poem, the, Hand, the Hands of God. He said, is it a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? But it is a much more fearful thing to fall out of them. I hear what some of you are thinking, but yeah, but that's my problem, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, it's not just your problem. It's not that simple. When we run from the Lord, our rebellion often creates problems for those around us. Jonah's rebellion created problems for the sailors on that ship. The text leaves no question, no question as to who caused that terrible storm. Verse four, but the Lord threw a great wind on the sea and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. God brought the storm because of Jonah and the sailors had to pay the price. Each cried out to his own God for rescue and the only answers they got from their gods were stronger winds and higher waves. The captain stumbled in that rocking ship down into the hole to wake up Jonah thinking maybe, maybe his God can help us. The captain roused him, get up. What a startling wake up call because those are the exact words that God said to Jonah when he called him to Nineveh. Get up. Jonah did. It's not, it's, it's my fault, he said. I'm, I'm running from God and he's gonna kill me for it and, 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 and your only hope to save this ship and yourselves is to, is to throw me overboard. Well, the, the sailors resisted but finally had no choice. A burly sailor with an anchor tattoo on one arm and mama tattooed on the other, grabbed his arms and 
Another burly, bushy, bearded sailor grabbed his legs and on the count of three, they pitched him in the sea and howling gusts became a gentle breeze. Roaring waves became as placid as a farm pond. Jonah's rebellion came that close to sinking that ship and drowning those sailors. But isn't that the way it often works? You rebel against the Lord. You rebel against what you know he wants for your life. And so many times the rippled waves of your disobedience crash into the lives of those closest to you. And those crashing waves, they might be something like depression or grouchiness that you feel in the civil war that's going on in your soul that makes you unpleasant to live with, or it could be something as dramatic as storms and accidents and who knows what all. You don't live in a vacuum. People you love the most may very well feel the weight and the distress of your running from the Lord. God being God, can still use that for good. Our missionary God's always on the the lookout for pagans to save, and he saved those pagan sailors. In our story, those sailors who moments before were each praying to his own false God, they end up seeking, praying to, and worshiping the one true God. The prodigal prophet acting more, more pagan than Gentile sailors. God is going to get what God wants and God can redeem even our disobedience in the distress that we bring on ourselves and others when we run from God. But why? Why why court the distress in the first place? It's ironic, isn't it? You, You run, you hide from God, you think, oh, this will solve my problems and it creates more problems of its own. Jonah got tossed in the sea. But... Thank God that's not the end of the story. Our God is a God who seeks good news. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. When we run and hide, God seeks us. How different God is in this story from Jonah. Jonah runs, God seeks. And God can seek us anywhere because God is everywhere. Unlike the child's game of hide and seek, God doesn't hide his eyes and count to 50 before the search begins. His eyes are always upon us. We can never escape his loving and watchful gaze. I mean, do you think God was caught off guard when Jonah made a run for it? I mean, can you see God up in heaven, eyes only on Nineveh, waiting, wondering what's taking Jonah so long to, to get there? And then throwing up his arms in panicky desperation? You don't suppose Jonah's not coming, do you? Where's Jonah? Anybody seen Jonah? I knew I should have kept my eye on him. Now I may never find him. That'd be some God, huh? Be a no God. God never loses sight of us. God can seek us anywhere because God is everywhere. The psalmist caught a glimpse of that that side of God and in Psalm 39 wrote, in awe of wonder, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, You're there if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Because God is everywhere, we can't escape him. We can't hide from him. Our running is in vain. Probably my favorite Twilight Zone episode, the woman on the cross-country trip who keeps passing the same hitchhiker. (laughs) It creeps me out just thinking about it. I mean, no matter where she goes, he's right there on the side of the road. Seen that one? Old man, tattered clothes and hat, holding out his thumb, smiling at her every time she passes by. She is creeped out. She can't escape him. It seems as if he is everywhere. God is everywhere. Can't escape him. And just when we think we've given God the slip, he shows up in a person, in a circumstance, on a billboard, in a bumper sticker, in a church building, something we happen to see, happen to hear, in a storm, in a fish. But this is not creepy. This is love. 
God shows up to remind us that though we may try to forget him, he will not forget us. And though we may try to lose him, he will not lose us. And as we can see from the storm and the fish and Jonah's experience, God has considerable resources to bring to bear in seeking us out. And not just, and not just seeking Jonah. Don't miss this. Seeking pagan sailors, seeking a large pagan city. Our missionary God is on the move to seek and to save the lost, both prophets and pagans, and God is relentless in the seeking. As Francis Thompson, first class failure in many ways, on the run from God, he flunked preschool, brought home a letter from the headmaster explaining to his parents that he just couldn't cut it. And so he went to medical school, but he, he, he never passed the exams that would have licensed him to practice medicine. He, he got hooked on opium and for the most part became a frustrated poet who was ruled by his addictions. But in spite of this running, running from God, he never could shake the fact that God was pursuing him with relentless love. And Thompson's most famous poem, maybe his only famous poem, is one in which he calls God the hound of heaven. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I hid from him and under running laughter from those strong feet that followed, followed after. And then Thompson hears God say, whom wilt thou found, find to love ignoble thee? Save me, save only me. All which I took from thee I did not take, not for thy harms, but that thou might seek it in my arms. This hound of heaven can be a very pesky God. Jonah found that out and so will we. If we try to run and hide from God. How then do we respond to a God like this? We could relish in the glory and wonder of it all. I mean, what kind of God cares so deeply for someone like you and me, like a rebellious prophet, like a wicked city, like Nineveh, what kind of God would go to such lengths to chase us down and get us on the narrow way that leads to life? I mean, if we wanna run, why doesn't God just brush us off? saying, good riddance, there's a lot of other people in the world, willing people. Why does he stick with us so? Why is the hound of heaven so relentless in his hot pursuit in the likes of you and me? Because he loves us. Because he loves you. Because he desires relationship with you. Because he wants to bless you. He wants to make you a blessing. Because he, he wants you, he wants your pagan neighbor, he wants even wicked Ninevites to repent and to find life in him. It's amazing. In our rebellion and in our escape, God chases us down. And if you don't think it can get more dramatic than Jonah and the fish, how about Jesus and the cross? While we were still sinners, helpless ungodly enemies. Christ came to seek us, save us, die for us, rise from the dead for us, and through his death and resurrection, he can save anyone from the most moral to the most vile. There's glory and wonder in that. Relishing that, that's one way to respond to this God who seeks. And here's another, surrender. Follow him. Trust him. Raise the white flag and trust him. God knows what's best for you. He loves you. His purposes are good. Don't run from him, run to him. It's the best thing to do and don't just run to him, run with him as he goes about the business of seeking and saving all who have lost their way. Several years ago, a newspaper reported this story, a woman driving home. She noticed a huge truck riding behind her, right on her bumper. She stepped on the gas to try to gain some distance, but when she sped up, the truck sped up, faster, faster, riding right on her tail. The woman was spooked. She made a quick exit off the freeway. The truck followed. The woman turned up a main street, hoping to lose the truck in the traffic, but the truck stayed with her, ran a red light to do so, panicked. She whipped into a gas station, came to a screeching halt, jumped out of her car, screaming bloody murder. The truck driver sprang from his truck. He raced toward the car, yanked open the back door, and pulled out a man who was hidden on the floorboard of the back seat. 
the woman was running from the wrong person. Up high in his truck, the driver saw something she was blind to. So he chased her down for her own good. Not to curse her, but to bless her. He chased her down to save her. Some of you are running from God today. Some of you in the room, some of you online. You think you can get away from him, don't you? (laughs) Better look over your shoulder. The hound of heaven is hot on your heels. Father, thank you for loving us enough to chase us down from our stupid decisions and our reckless behavior and our rebellion against you. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Somebody today, you're, you're hot on the heels of somebody today in this room or watching online. Would you, would you catch them today? <laughs> would you gather them up in your arms? save them, bring them home, give them, give them, God, the joy that they'll only find in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you today online, on site, to respond to this amazing God who loves us so much. I invite you to give your life to him. He's chasing you down to save you. So surrender, give yourself to him. He will forgive your sins. He's the only one who can save you. And he will do it. And he won't scold you for being on the run. He'll throw a party because he got you home. So I invite you to turn to him today. I invite you, Christian, if you're running from your duty or even trying to run from God because you're just upset at him, mad at him for this or that, stop. Let him... Let him sweep you up and give you what you need today. Come join the church. God puts that on your heart. Sometimes God uses the church to chase after people, to chase after the lost in a city, in a neighborhood, even inside these walls. Just take a moment of quiet. Listen for the footsteps of the hand of heaven and turn to him. We're gonna stand together and sing hymn of response. There'll be ministers here. Come, let us pray with you, help you make that connection with God online. Text the word action to 94,000, someone there, or chat, live chat, someone there will help you to get your connection with God today.